Today is day 307, and we're reading from Luke chapter 14 and 15. The established religious crowd had serious problems with Jesus and his methodology along with his theology. Uh, it seemed as though they were continually reaching out to him and inviting him to come over to their homes like the Pharisees and scribes and, and the religious leaders. And yet their troubled hearts were especially directed towards his healing of the sick. Now they said it was because he did it on the Sabbath, but it's remarkable that they missed the miracle for the traditions that uh, got in the way. The other thing was his mingling and eating with sinners. That was something they didn't do. They felt they would be contaminated, but it demonstrated that in their minds that Jesus uh, couldn't be who he claimed to be because he certainly would have not wanted to be around them if he knew what kind of sinners they were. But this is uh, the very heart and nature of God Almighty. Uh, he, the Bible gives us a picture of what often will keep folks out of the kingdom of God. He speaks about power and position as the backdrop of the Pharisees and the scribes. He speaks of arrogance and pride, but for many, it's going to boil down simply to excuses and, and the delaying of the invitation. These two things are of greatest concern for the overwhelming majority of people whom we tell others about Christ. I find that for many, it's excuses and delaying of the time. Jesus begins by telling stories. This was his means of bringing uh, home a point uh, with significant punch. He speaks of a great banquet and how many and everyone, in fact, had been invited, but especially the more prominent people. And uh, he's compelling them to come to his dinner. So he sends servants out to invite them. And yet the excuses that come back are remarkable. One came back, one sent word and said, hey, I bought land, uh, but I haven't seen it and I need to go check it out. Now, who buys land, property, without first reviewing and observing it? And then the second one says, hey, listen, I bought uh, a team of oxen and, and I need to go and test them out. Who buys a car without, first of all, uh, driving, testing it, and, and uh, making sure of its quality? And then finally one says, hey, listen, I got married and uh, I'm married to a wife and I cannot come. All of these are flimsy excuses that demonstrate a tendency in human nature to put off uh, that which is of priority. Many of the excuses that others use or you and I have used are just diminished uh, attempts to try to delay what really is of great significance because we know that it's going to alter our lives and demand a cost uh, and there will be consequences. So it's these excuses keep many, if not most people, out of the kingdom of God. This is the premise of what we're reading right here. Then the servants um, com are commanded to go into what's interesting language, the the highways and the hedges and compel them to come. That becomes those people that are often uh, kind of lost in the shuffle, people that maybe are marginalized, people that uh, others might not want to get around because of their lifestyle and and because of their reputation. But, but God is saying here, go and compel them. Open. It's an open invitation. Invite them. The others didn't want to come now. Go invite uh, these to come and that my house may be filled. And Jesus describes the difficulty of coming to Christ. Uh, you, uh, he says, you know, you, uh, you're, you're, you gotta hate your mother, your father, your son, your daughter. And that language, of course, is repulsive for us, but we know that in the original, the word hate means to love less. You're gonna have to love less Father, mother, son, daughter, you can't, you can't be mine. He talks about you're going to have to forsake all. And that means everything. You're going to have to put everything down, push it back uh, in order to receive the kingdom benefits. And then he says you got to bear the cross and follow Jesus. You're going to have to, that cross representing execution, that cross of shame and disgrace, you're going to have to be willing to take that up. So, and here's what Jesus said. So likewise, whoever does not forsake all cannot be my disciple. That's pretty point blank, uh, pretty definite language. Jesus then reveals a heavenly celebration, something that we do not consider 
uh, over lost people finding Jesus, over those who have strayed, who come back home. Heaven uh, obviously must be aware of certain earthly events. Otherwise, there couldn't be rejoicing in heaven. So this is one indication that there is some sort of connection between heaven and earth, that the hosts of heaven, the saints of heaven, have some connection of information, at least as it pertains to people who come to Christ, who come home to Jesus, because it says that they are celebrating in heaven. In fact, it says the angels rejoice over one repentant sinner. Now think about that, that when a person gets saved, when a person comes to Christ, it's not just here in heaven, that there, or here on earth that there's rejoicing, but heaven is signaled and uh, made aware of uh, this significant, what an incredible thought to consider. And then the question is boiled down to us, do we, do we have that, level of celebration over people who come to Jesus? Have we lost the excitement and the zeal and significance of what it means when a person repents and receives Christ for the forgiveness of sin over the one lost person being found? I think that we in this day have prioritized so many other things in the body of Christ and we've minimized the most important thing of which heaven puts great value on. And there's danger of being like that second son, the prodigal son, the second son, uh, anger uh, that that son had, refusing to go in to participate in the party and the celebration. The father pleading with uh, his son that remained home, come and celebrate for what has happened. But there was jealousy and there was envy and a sense that, hey, I've been faithful and loyal and, uh, and I've been good and I've, what have I gotten out of this? And these are the things, attitudes that you and I have to watch when those coming into the body of Christ, uh, there's that zeal and excitement that goes on. A lot of times they can get the attention. It distracted uh, by the younger son's reward. That's what distracted this, this older son. Um, he saw the best robe being put upon him, the rings and the sandals. He saw the fatted calf, the father's running to this womanizing prodigal son, being merry and celebrating. This is the picture of the priority of winning the lost at any cost with great joy. We must never lose this without contempt, without complaint. We must participate in this great venture of helping to win people to Christ. This is heaven's priority. It must be our priority, the priority of finding the lost coin, finding the lost sheep, finding the lost son. You and I have a mandate, a mission, and we must make that a priority in our life.